Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I'm going to walk you through the process of valuing Gazprom stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Gazprom is one of the world's largest natural gas companies in terms of reserves, production, and market cap. It is vertically integrated and active in every area of the gas industry, including exploration and production, refining, transportation, distribution, marketing, and power generation. It has the world's largest reserves of natural gas, accounting for 16% of global reserves and 70% of Russia's reserves. It also accounts for 11% of the world's natural gas production. It exports 32% of the gas used throughout Europe via its pipelines that the company built. It has 34 trillion cubic meters of natural gas reserves. In 2020, it produced 455 billion cubic meters of natural gas. Natural gas lasts forever. It has an indefinite shelf life. It is used for electricity, heating, transportation, air conditioning, and much more. Gazprom is also a large oil producer through its subsidiary Gazprom Neft. It produces 12% of Russia's oil and gas condensate. The primary use for condensate is to make fuels like gasoline. Some people refer to condensate as natural gasoline. It is a key element for making certain types of plastic and is an effective dilutant used to stabilize heavier crude oil and get it to the correct weight before it gets sent to the refinery. 38% of the company is owned by the Russian government. The company is headquartered in Moscow, Russia and was founded in 1989. It trades on the pink sheets, Mexican Bolsa, Bulgaria, Zitra, Vienna, Moscow, Kazakhstan, Buenos Aires, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 118 billion market cap. They're trading at $10 a share and they have 11.8 billion shares outstanding. We're looking at the ticker that trades on the pink sheet. So all the numbers in my Excel file are in US dollars, but their financials are all in Russian rubles. I had to convert from rubles to US dollars. Let's look at their financials, which I converted to US dollars. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have negative free cash flow in 18 and 19, a big positive in 2020, and a much bigger positive in the trailing 12 months, over 10 billion of free cash flow. That's a lot of cash to work with. Free cash flow is the cash that's remaining after paying all your expenses. That's the cash that's left over for you, the investor. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive every year. It peaked in 2018 at 20 billion. Revenue is the sales for the company and that peaked in 2018 at 115 billion. It was lowest in 2020 at 88 billion. That's mainly due to lower commodity prices. But their revenue is coming back up in the trailing 12 months. It's higher than 2019. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Here's a breakdown of their 18, 19, and 20 revenue from their annual report. About half their revenue is from gas sales. And you can see their revenue goes down every year in every category. It's not that they're producing less or selling less. It's just the price of the commodity has gone down. Below that is 1.8 trillion in refined products. Refined means taking out the impurities so you can use the gas, like to put into your car or to put into a plane or to use for electricity. So they sell the most gas before they take out the impurities. And then the customer they send it to, they remove the impurities so the end user can use it. Or Gazprom removes the impurities and sells the gas. That's what refined products is. Then they have half a trillion in crude oil and condensate. It looks like they generate revenue from selling electricity and heat directly to the end user. They offer transportation services, that's 223 billion. And then other. They make money the same way every company makes money how much of their product or service they sell, and how much they charge. Demand for their product has always been pretty high and should be pretty high for the foreseeable future. The amount they charge is pretty volatile. In 2020, you can see it was really low natural gas prices. That's why their revenue was so low. 
In 2019 and 2018, it was much higher. And they had a good amount of revenue, especially in 2018. 2021 looks like it could be their best year. Look how high natural gas prices are. As long as prices are above $3, the company's going to make money and they could probably pay you a higher dividend. But if it's below $3 like it was in 2020, they might not be as generous with their dividend payments. And also the stock price probably won't go up. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost of labor, the cost to transport the gas and oil, also the cost to extract the gas and oil, all that is part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, which peaked in 2018, lowest in 2020. Below that is their operating expenses, which is pretty consistent each year. And below that is their operating income, which peaked in 2018 with their highest revenue. It was lowest in 2020 with their lowest revenue. They spent $21 billion of interest on their debt in the trailing 12 months. That's a lot more than 2020 and 2019. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And they have a pretty good amount of net income every year, especially in 18, 19, and the trailing 12 months. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you can see they generate a lot of operating cash flow every year, peaking in the trailing 12 months. Yahoo Finance doesn't have the detail for their operating cash flow, and I couldn't find it in their reporting either. I'd be curious to see why 2020 operating cash flow is higher than 2018 and 19, but we don't have the details, so we'll just accept the numbers as they are. And they spend a lot of money in CapEx, about one and a half trillion rubles a year. It's very expensive to build out those pipelines and all the infrastructure. Operating cash flow minus CapEx give you your free cash flow, and that was negative in 18 and 19, positive in 2020, and the highest in a trillion 12 months. It looks like they're using equity and debt to fund their operations. They added $323 billion of equity in 2019, the same amount in the trailing 12 months. When a company adds equity, that increases the shares outstanding, making your shares less valuable. And each year, they issue more debt than they pay down, so they're adding debt each year. But debt is a cheap way to fund your operations. It's a lot cheaper than equity. So it's a great way to fund operations as long as you're bringing in a good amount of cash flow, which they are. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have 15 trillion of equity. They raised 325 billion from selling their business and they profited 14 and a half trillion from running their business. So that's really impressive how high their retain earnings are. Retain earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes minus the sum of the dividends you paid out. So they're a really profitable business. They bought back 331 million of stock. When a company buys back stock, it takes it off the open market and puts it onto the balance sheet. Let's look at the capital structure. 210 billion of equity, 70 billion of debt. They're 75% equity, 25% debt. Their net debt is 47 billion. And their WAC, according to Simply Wall Street, is 12.37%. Finbox is 8.3%. So I took the average of these two numbers, and that comes out to 11.19%. And that's a pretty high WAC. If a company is located in a certain country, then a country risk premium is added onto the WAC. The higher the WAC, the lower the valuation. And this is the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 113 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $102 billion. We divide that by 11.8 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $8.60. They're trading at $10. So they're trading at a 17% premium. It's a sell according to the model. So I'm going to change that WAC to 8%, which would be closer to the WAC if they were a U.S. company. And look how high the valuation is. That just shows you how risky it can be to invest in certain countries. The average analyst projects their revenue to decrease 0.4%. I decreased their revenue 0.4% for the next two years. Then I increased it 5% for the next two years. Because I can't imagine their revenue decreasing for that many years. I'm pretty bullish on almost all the commodities, gas, copper, oil. So I don't think their revenue is going to be going down too much. But just to be conservative, I went with the analyst estimates for two years. So that's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. 
I summed up these two free cash flow numbers and I divided by these two revenue numbers. I excluded 18 and 19 since they had negative free cash flow. So when you take these two numbers divided by these two numbers, that comes out to 8%. So I multiplied their revenue estimates by 8%. That's how I got their future free cash flow estimates. Simply Wall Street's valuation is 1062. They're saying the stock is 6% undervalued. Three analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $11. This is where the stock has been trading the past 12 months. So you can see it's done really well. And I'm sure you know the reason the stock is doing so well is because the price of gas is going up so much. Their stock price is highly correlated to the price of natural gas. They pay an annual dividend of 35 cents. That's a 3.5% dividend yield. But last year, their dividend was 44 cents and their stock was a lot lower. So their dividend yield was really high back then. I have a feeling they're going to raise their dividend because they could definitely afford it. It's only 28% of their net income, 40% of their free cash flow. Their industry pays a 4.4% dividend. So they're lower than their industry. But analysts are projecting them to grow their dividend to 11.5%. That's a pretty big jump from 3.6%. Global energy consumption is expected to increase 22% from now until 2040. Natural gas and renewable energy accounts for 78% of that. The top part of this chart is the expected global energy consumption each year until 2040. And the bottom part is the global natural gas consumption until 2040. We all know demand for energy consumption is always going to be there. Unless you're Amish, it's the only way to get through your day-to-day -day activities in your home, on your job, in your car, everywhere. The tricky part is identifying the price of the underlying commodity. If you can do that, you'd be super rich. They have a really low beta, 0.28. That means the stock moves one quarter of the market. It's not volatile. The stock has gone up a lot the past 52 weeks, up 160%, while the S&P is up 41%. The 52-week low was 381. The high was 1072 and the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. Half a million shares are traded each day in the U.S. Of the 12 billion shares outstanding, 6 billion are on float, 5% are held by institutions. Their employee count has been pretty steady the past few years, around half a million employees. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $13,000 today. That's only a 3% annual return. If you invested in 2013, 14, 15, 16, you would have a big return today. The Russian government is the biggest shareholder at 38%. OJSC is a Russian holding company that manages assets in the oil and gas industry. They own 11% of the stock, then Capital Research, Vanguard, and BlackRock. Let's look at their financial ratios. Look at these price multiples in 8PE, that stock price over earnings per share. Below 15 is considered amazing, and they're at 8. A 1.1 price to sales, so their market cap is pretty close to their revenue. And a price to book of 0.6. That means if the company liquidated all its assets today, it would be able to give each shareholder $18, giving you an 80% return on your investment in liquidation. Their return on invested capital is a little low at 6.5%. They can cover the interest payments on their debt 20 times. Their ROE is 7.1%, which is larger than a market median, much larger than a market average. Their current ratio and quick ratio are above 1. They have 1.7 trillion rubles of cash on their balance sheet and 890 billion of inventory. They're really well capitalized. They generated 10 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have 20 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities and they paid out $4.1 billion of dividend payments, so they have $26 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of nine companies in the same industry as Gazprom, and if Gazprom has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. Their PE is much better than the average, the best on this list, their average in price to sales, and they have the best price to book. They have a good current ratio, their ROE is higher than average, they're lower in debt than the average company, and they're a really big company, 118 billion market cap, the average is almost 100 billion, and their dividend is a little lower than the average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 17% premium, all their numbers look amazing, how could the stock be overvalued and not undervalued?
But when you look at these numbers, you're looking at the past. The past doesn't equal the future. If they were a US domiciled company, their market cap would be double or triple where it is. But there's that added risk of being in Russia. And just because a company is generating lots of profits doesn't mean it's undervalued. Say you go to a restaurant and you love their steak and you always pay $29. On Valentine's Day, they're charging $59 for that steak. You still love the steak, but you're not gonna buy it because it's overvalued. You're gonna wait till the following weekend when it's $29. So just because something looks really appealing doesn't mean you should buy it. You should wait till the price point comes down to where you feel comfortable. But everybody has their own opinion on the price point of any company. You may think this company should be trading at a 200 billion market cap. In that case, you should buy the stock. But only time will tell to figure out if I'm correct or if I'm incorrect. I rank their free cash flows, revenue, and ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.